So we went to Kennedy Space Center to watch the Discovery do its final launch. And uh, this was a few years back and I just found this video so I wanted to share it. And the first thing I'm going to show is a bit of a uh, speech that, the, that a veteran astronaut was giving and taking questions from kids. Here it goes. It's the same with being in space. You know, all the pictures are cool, but they're just not as cool as what you can see. And everybody, and it doesn't matter if it's a first time space flyer or somebody who's flown seven times, every time you get up there and you look out the window, what you, this, the whole sensation is, holy mackerel, look at that. It's just, it's incredible what your eyes can see. You can see about 10 million different shades of colors and you can see textures that you can't get in a film. Uh, it's just not any way to record it. So that is really the coolest thing in the world is to look out there and, and see the Earth. Okay, we've got the last question right here. How long did it take, how long was, did you have to practice until you could go into space? Um, actually, the, the practice where we do our training, it starts about nine months before you actually fly for that specific flight. But your training really starts the day you show up at, at Johnson Space Center as an astronaut. So you start training for a year just to get qualified. Once you're qualified, then they select you for a crew at some point, and then you spend the nine months. Now, there's another answer to that, too, is that to train, to actually get yourself prepared to be an astronaut, you're doing that now. When you go to school, you study, you study hard, and make sure you learn it the first time. I can tell you from personal experience, it's really hard to try to learn it the second time and come back and learn all the stuff you should have learned. So, if you want to be an astronaut, or whatever it is you want to do, just keep that in mind when you're looking at that, that math problem or the reading or whatever it is in school. It might seem like a real pain, but just go ahead and do it because it's so much easier to do it the first time. And that's how you get prepared to go do whatever it is you want to do. And if you want to be an astronaut, we got a planet called Mars that we want you to put your first steps on the surface of that. How's that? And Jim, I'm going to ask if the director could switch over to NASA Live right now because we've got a very interesting picture coming to us from the flight deck. Could you tell us what we're seeing right now? Yeah, what you're seeing right now, this is a camera that's in the commander's left-hand window, and it's looking right at Rick Sturkow, and he's getting strapped in. And what you see in the background is our what we call the astronaut support person, and uh, the ASP, as we call them, is another astronaut that's there to help that crew, and they're dedicated to helping them get on board. And here you see Danny Olivas, and as they're strapping as they're strapping uh, Rick into the flight deck, Danny's about to uh, go into the mid-deck and start getting strapped into his seat. And that hatch you see right behind him that says Discovery on it, you go right in there and you turn a little bit left, and then his seat is right there. And as you can see, the whole crew is going to be laying on their back. And they're going to be laying on their backs until 1.36 in the morning. So. So as you can see, you're going to get a little bit tired of just sitting there, and you're kind of cramped with that big suit on you while you're there. And what Rick is doing is he's, he's adjusting his harness so he'll be comfortable, and then he's also got a little pad that's right underneath the small of his back called the lumbar pad, and he'll adjust that as well so he'll make it as comfortable as possible while you're sitting there. As you might imagine, you're laying on a parachute, and it's on a pretty thin hard metal uh, seat. It gets a little uncomfortable there after a while. And what they're also doing is they're getting everything configured, so his knee board's in the right place, everything is set up. And here you see Nicole, she's on the mid-deck and already strapped in, and they're showing her where everything is and where her knee board is, making sure it's right where she wants it to be. And then here in a minute, what they're going to do is they're going to have everybody put their gloves on, close their yes, visors, and then they'll do the comm checks, and you'll hear and each one of them do it. You'll launch, have so Commander we'll talking to LCC, we'll and then you'll have the Commander talking to Houston. So as Josh noted, uh, there was some lightning out in the distance, and when any time that there's li well, this was with the old shuttles. Any time that there's lightning within a certain vicinity of the launch site, they do not send the shuttle up due to the possibility of electromagnetic interference or something, um, which I thought really primitive. And you know, hopefully the new shuttles are going to be different when they make them, um, but we were concerned. We weren't really sure if it was really going to go up or not, so here we go. See, let's keep going. Good question. Okay, question right here. 
what's the scariest thing that happened to you, or what's the weirdest thing that happened to you? <laughs> the scariest thing, um, you know, I don't know what the scariest thing would be, but the thing that we all are afraid of is uh, we really don't want to mess things up. So, of course, that's what the crew's thinking about right now. And I can guarantee you, the rookies particularly, they're when they get in the vehicle, they're going to be laying there thinking, boy, I sure don't want to mess anything up. Everybody's dependent on me to get this job done. So that's what everybody's kind of scared of. Um, the weirdest thing was probably uh, on my first flight, I was in the uh, what we call the space app, and it was a big module we put in the payload bay. And I had two of the crew members, and we had a couple of minutes where we could just fool around for a minute. So they, they took me, and I was all punched up like this, and they spun me. And then they spun me in all three axes, so I was tumbling in all directions. That felt pretty weird. You know, when you're, you do that here in one of those chairs, you know, that flips around, that's pretty weird. But do it when you're in zero G, that's really weird. And next question right here. Well, that video was really awesome, guys, and I hope you liked it. Just to hear what the astronaut dude had to say. I wish I could remember his name, but I don't. Um, turned out that they had a, uh, a hatch seal problem that night, so the launch was canceled. Yep, some guy didn't close the door right. And the following night, I think we stayed again, hoping to see it, and then there was lightning. And so they canceled the launch again. So you finally, you know, my the people I was with are kind of elderly, and we go back home. I don't want to keep them out for so long, so far away from home in a little motel room. So we go back here to South Florida, and uh, they finally, it finally seems like they're really going to get the thing to take off. So here we are in front of the computer, huddled around, and trying to trying to watch the thing live. So here we go with that. It's critical function. Yeah, really. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. The sound suppression water system has been activated. We have a go for main engine start. And we have main engine start. Two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Celebrating its 25th birthday All right. by racking up science. We're going out. You see the top? Yeah. Dead? Where should it be? I don't see anything. Is that it? Back there? What do you say? Nothing actually. <laughs> yeah, it's already up by now. It was going pretty fast. Well, that's, that's probably it by now. You sure that way's north? Star, Josh. So obviously a major bummer. I mean, uh, 
the two nights that we stayed in Cape Canaveral, didn't get to see the thing launch. And then uh, at home, we didn't even see it in the sky either. So uh, we were kind of upset with NASA. And uh, I was kind of in the mood to talk about cutting their budget too, just right along with everyone else. But I've come along, you know. Um, the old ships that we used to have, unfortunately, they hadn't advanced in like 20, 30 years. And some guy doesn't close the door right. The ship doesn't go up that night. There's a little bit of heat lightning in the area the next night. The ship doesn't go up again. Um, but these new generation ships, they seem quite a bit more advanced. I'm really hoping that these kind of like embarrassing things um, have been conquered a little bit. And, uh, and I hope that the space program does remain in existence and remain strong because we might need it as China moves into space and, you know, the way that they think, they might like to militarize some of their satellites, um, even if they just want to fight against other satellites. But satellites provide a lot of really valuable um, reconnaissance for our military. So, who rules the skies rules the world, and we have to sort of get on this. And that's all I got to say for tonight. Uh, so, if you got a kid who's an astronaut, have him watch this and try to get him into NASA. They do have a lot of geniuses there, and they can do great things if we give them the resources. That's my two cents. I'm out.